The gist of the merge sort is a divide and conquer strategy. We first consider each element as if it's its own sublist, and then we take pairs of those sublists and merge them together. And it's in the merger process that we sort the items. So the result of each merger is a sorted sublist. We keep merging these sublists until finally everything is merged back into one sorted list. What makes this generally one of the more efficient sorting algorithms is how we do the merge process. Say we're merging the sublists C and E and A and G. And again, be clear that we always merge sublists which are in themselves sorted. So note that C and E, that's properly sorted, and A and G, that's also properly sorted. Now, to merge these two sublists, we could just concatenate them together and then sort the result using any other sort algorithm, but the whole point of the merge sort is that we have an efficient way of merging two sorted lists into one unified sorted list. The way this process works is we compare the first items of both respective lists, and we take the smaller of the two values as the first item for our merged list. So here in the comparison of C and A, A is the smaller value, so we take A. Having already taken A, A is no longer valid for consideration, so we do a new comparison this time again between C, but now with the next value of the second list, the G. And so in that comparison, C and G, C is smaller, so we take C. And now C has been consumed, so in the next comparison, we compare the next value in that list, E, again against G, and E is smaller than G, so we take E as the next value in our merged list. And then finally, one of the two lists has been exhausted, so we just take the remaining values from the other list. In this case, just the value G. So we end up with our merged list of A, C, E, and G. Expressed as a function, the merge process looks like this. We have a function merge, which takes two lists as arguments. The first we call left, and the second we call right. The left list and the right list. Though it doesn't matter which one is which, that's just a convention with merge to refer to the left list and the right list. And in the function, our goal is to produce a new merged list, which we initialized starting out empty. And also we're going to need an index keeping track of our progress through the left list, and an index keeping track of our progress through the right list, and we initialize both of those to zero, to the start of those two lists. The actual work is then done in an infinite loop, with actually four mutually exclusive cases, because in each iteration we have four different cases. There's the case where the right side list has been exhausted, in which case right index will be greater than or equal to the length of the right list. There's the case where the left list has been exhausted, in which case left index will be greater than or equal to the length of the left list. And then there's the case where neither has been exhausted, and in our comparison of the values at left index and right index in the respective lists, the value in the left list is smaller than the right list. And finally, in the last case, it might be that the value at right index in the right list is smaller than the value at left index in the left list. So again, we have the top two cases where no comparison is done because one of the two lists has been exhausted. And then in the two bottom cases, neither list has been exhausted, so we do a comparison, and in one case the left value is smaller, and in the other the right value is smaller. In the case where we do the comparison and the left value is smaller, then we take that value and we append it to the merged list, and we increment left index by one. In the case where the right list value is smaller, we take that value and append it to the end of the merged list, and in increment right index by one. And then in the case where the right side list has been exhausted, we want to take the remaining values from the left list, append them to the merged list, and we're done. We return that result. In the case where the left list is exhausted first, we take the remaining values of the right list, and we append them to the merged list and return that result. Note that the controlling condition of the list here is simply true, because we want the list to just iterate indefinitely until within the loop, uh, we get one of the two cases where either list has been exhausted, and so we return a list. Because one or the other list will get exhausted eventually, this isn't an infinite loop. In case you're confused about the Python code here, recall that a colon inside the subscript operator used on a list, that's a special syntax for selecting a range for a list. So when we write left subscript left index colon end subscript, that doesn't return just a single value from the left list. It returns as a list all of the values in the left list from left index to the end. The plus operator here then takes that list and concatenates it to the end of the merged list. If you have two lists A and B, A plus B will concatenate first all of the items of A 
and then all of the items of B into a new list. And that here is the list we are returning, the concatenation of merged plus all the remaining items from the left list. Now that we have our merge function, we can write a function to do the actual merge sort. The function is quite simple, but perhaps a bit tricky to understand because it's recursive. In the base case here, which you may recall in recursion refers to the case which terminates the chain of recursion. It's the, it's the case in which no more recursive calls are made. In the base case here, if length of the list is less than or equal to 1, then merge sort simply returns the list itself, which makes sense because, of course, a list of 0 or 1 items is always sorted. It can't possibly be unsorted. If, however, the length of the list is greater than 1, then we split that list into two separate lists, a left list and a right list, then recursively sort those two lists with the merge sort function, and then finally use our merge function to merge together those two separately sorted lists, the left and the right, and that's what we return. So consider a simple case of a list of four elements. We pass that into merge sort, which then splits it into two even lists, a left and a right, which are then both independently passed to merge sort. In each of those calls to merge sort, the list of two items is split itself into two separate lists, each of one item, and those left and right lists are passed individually to the merge sort function. And in those merge sort calls, because the lists have one element, we've hit the base case. So those single item lists get returned unchanged from these deepest calls to merge sort. The two single item lists returned from merge sort get assigned to left and right, and then merged. So the basic pattern is that first, as many recursive calls are made as is necessary to split everything down into single element lists, those single element lists then get merged together into two element lists, and the two element lists then get merged into four element lists, and so on, until we finally merged everything back together into one list. A quick note again about the syntax here. In the first subscript of ls, where we have colon mid-index, that again is special Python syntax for extracting a range from a list. In this case, everything in the range from 0 up to, but not including, mid-index. So here, for the left list, we're taking everything up to, but not including, mid-index, and then for the right list, we're taking everything at mid-index up through the end. That's what that syntax means with the colon. Another thing to note here is that merge sort really doesn't require us to strictly split the list down the middle. Uh, we actually could split the list uh, randomly into, into a left and right list. It, it doesn't really matter. It, it'll work um, however we split the lists. Though, of course, it usually makes most sense to just divide the workload into even chunks. So that's usually why we just split the list down the middle. Like the merge sort, quicksort is a recursive divide-and-conquer process. In this algorithm, though, we split the list into two by selecting a so-called pivot value, which could be any random value from the list, and then filing the remaining elements into two sublists, one for the values less than the pivot, the other for values greater. We then recursively repeat this process for both of those sublists. So here, for example, we'll keep things simple and pick just the last value in the list as our pivot rather than pick randomly. So our pivot is D, and then we go through the remaining elements sequentially left to right and file them into the two lists, the one to the right of the pivot and the one to the left. C, A, and B are all less than D, so they make up the left list, and E, F, and G are all greater than D, so they form the right list. We then recursively do the same with the two sublists, again not picking pivots at random, but rather just using the last value. So our two pivots are B and G. So B ends up with A to its left and C to its right, whereas G ends up with E and F to its left. Notice in this case there were no values greater than G, so there's nothing to G's right. We now recursively apply this same logic to the three sublists. A and C are the only elements in their lists, so of course they are selected as the pivot. And then in the list of E and F, F is the last value, so we select that as our pivot. And we end up with A without anything to its left or right, because of course it was the only element in its list. And the same for C, but then F has a single element E to its left. Recursively applying this logic one last time, we use E as a pivot, but of course there are no other values, so it has nothing to its left or right. So now, here in the end, we've recursively applied the process until every value has been used as a pivot. The way our sorted list gets constructed is that when the recursive call on the left and right sublists returns, the sorted sublists they return get concatenated with the pivot in the middle. So, for example, in the case of our pivot B, 
its sublists are A and C, and those are both just single element lists, so they are the recursive base case. They just get returned as is, and then those two sublists are concatenated with B in the middle. Then in the case of pivot D, its recursive call on the sublist CAB, that returns the sorted list of A, B, and C, which we just concatenated together. And D's right sublist, EFG, should also come back sorted. So now we can concatenate those together with D in the middle. So now, looking at a function for quick sort, again, it, we just take one argument, the list to sort, and first off, we have our base case, the case where the length of the list is less than or equal to 1, in which case we just return the list itself, because, of course, a list of one element has nothing to sort. When the list is longer than one element, first what we do is we get the pivot value, and again, we'll just use the last value in the list as our pivot, and recall that in Python, when you specify a negative index, you're getting the elements relative from the end, so negative 1 is the last element in the list. We then get a list of all the remaining elements, all the elements but the pivot, and assign it to a variable rest. That's what subscript colon negative 1 does. It, it returns a list of all the elements but the last. And then we create our left and right sublists, which start out empty, but then we loop through all the values in rest, and if that value is less than pivot, then we append it to the left list, otherwise we append it to the right list. We then recursively quick sort the left and right list, and once those recursive calls return with the properly sorted list, we concatenate them together with pivot in the middle, and this produces the sorted list which we return. Note that when we do the concatenation, we put pivot in its own list, because otherwise pivot is just a non-list value, and you can't concatenate a non-list with a list, so we have to put it into a list first. Now, the version of quicksort I just showed you is not the usual version, because what we did involved producing several extra lists. In practice, quicksort is usually implemented in an in-place fashion, meaning we sort by moving things around within the original list, rather than producing additional lists. The way an in-place quicksort works partly explains why we chose the last element as our pivot, because it makes most sense for this in-place method. We start off by initializing what we'll call the pivot destination index, represented by a blue arrow, to the first element. We're then going to iterate from index 0 up to, but not including, the last index, and we're going to compare the value at that index against the pivot. And if it is less than the pivot, we're going to do two things. First, we're going to swap the value at that index with the value at the pivot destination index, and then after that, we're going to increment the pivot destination index by 1. So here's how this plays out in this example. First we start at index 0, compare that against the pivot as indicated by the dotted line, and know the value e is not less than the pivot, so we're not going to do anything in this pass. If it were, we would swap this value with the value at the pivot destination index, though in this case the pivot destination index is the same location, so there would be no actual swap, but we would then increment the pivot destination index. So it does matter that we compare the pivot against this first element, because it might be the case that we want to advance the pivot destination index in this pass. In this case, though, we don't do that. In the second pass, we're now comparing the item at index 1, the second element, against the pivot. Is C less than D? Yes, it is. So we're going to swap that location with the location of the pivot destination index, so C and E get swapped, and also we advance the pivot destination index by 1. In the next pass, we compare index 2, the third item, against the pivot, and yes, A is less than D, so we perform a swap with that location and the location of the pivot destination index, so we swap E and A, and then we increment the pivot destination index. In the next pass, we compare index 3, the fourth item, B, against the pivot D, and yes, B is less than D, so we swap that location with the location of the pivot destination index, so once again, we're swapping with E, and then we increment the pivot destination index. So now we're done with our loop, but our final step is to actually swap the pivot with the pivot destination index. So E and D get swapped, and we end up with our properly partitioned, as we say, list. Our pivot D now has only smaller values to its left and larger values to its right. Looking at the code for this process, again, first we start by getting the pivot value, and we initialize our pivot destination index to 0. Then we iterate from index 0 up to the second to last index, so up to but not including the index, which is the length of the list minus 1. And in the loop, we see if the value at the current index is less than the pivot, and if so, we are going to swap the value at that index with the pivot destination index, and then increment the pivot destination index by 1. 
notice here, uh, for simplicity, I'm presuming the existence of a swap method just to make the code more compact. The Python list type doesn't actually have such a swap method, but just assume what this does is it takes the two index values and swaps the values at those indexes in the list. In any case, once our loop is done, our final step is to swap the values at the pivot destination index with the pivot itself, which is still sitting at index negative 1. Now, for the sake of our in-place quicksort function, we're actually going to need a more general version of this partitioning process where we can specify a start and end index, that is, take some range of an existing list and partition it in this fashion as if that range is its own sublist. Like, for example, if we specify a start index of 10 and an end index of 50, then we're partitioning all the values in that range using the last value, the, the value at index 50, as the pivot. So here's a partition function which does just this. It takes three arguments, a list, a start index, and an end index, and it's going to partition the elements starting at start index and ending and including the n index. So the value at n index is what we're going to use as our pivot. This code actually looks just like what we just saw, except we're using start index in place where we used index 0, and we're using n index in place where previously we were using uh, negative 1. Note though, at the end, when we're done partitioning, what we return is the pivot destination index, because that's the information which our quicksort algorithm is going to need. So here is that quicksort function, and because it's going to work recursively, we have to add the arguments for start index and end index. This means if you want to pass in a whole list to sort, you're simply going to specify a start index of 0 and an end index, which is one less than the length of that list. Looking now at the code, first thing we do is test whether the start index is less than the end index, because first off, in the case where the range has just one element, the start index is going to be equal to the end index, in which case we want to do nothing. And also we do this test because in cases where the partitioning ends up with no values to either the left or right, some of the recursive calls to quicksort are going to have a start index that's actually greater than an end index. And those are actually our base cases. Again, they're cases where we want to do nothing because there's nothing left to sort recursively. For the so-called normal case, where the start index is actually less than end index because there's more than one item in the specified range, first thing we do is we partition our range by invoking partition with start index and end index, and that returns the index of where the pivot ended up in that partitioning. So then we can recursively sort the range to the left of the pivot index and also the range to the right. So the left side of the list will run from start index up to pivot index minus 1, and the right side list will run from pivot index plus 1 up to n index. Notice that there isn't any concatenating to do because the sorting all happens in place. We never here have more than just the one list, and we're just moving things around within that list. 